Hi everyone! This week we're going to talk about the first intermediate period, which included the 7th through 11th dynasties. So let's get started. For approximately 125 years, there was a quote-unquote dark period of Egyptian history, which we label the first intermediate period. This is of course a term that Egyptologists used to describe an era where there was political upheaval and Egypt was divided. The term was coined by Egyptologists George Steindorf and Henry Frankfurt in 1926. Of course, you must realize that when scholars label this period as chaotic, disastrous, or even weak, what we're describing is the Egyptian government and the elites of that time. This does not mean that the entirety of Egypt was co in complete chaos during this time, because in the first intermediate period, the local nomarchs continued to rise to power, which made the middle and lower class prosper. Whenever scholars reference a dark period in history, they're usually referring to a lack of historical records that are contemporary to that time. These historical records that are typically lacking would have only been produced by the highest class. During this period, the rule of Egypt was almost equally divided between three separate groups. As I mentioned previously, some Egyptologists placed the 7th and 8th dynasties within the Old Kingdom because those pharaohs were actually ruling out of Memphis. From the 9th and 10th dynasty, those pharaohs were ruling out of Heracleopolis in Lower Egypt. Only the first half of the 11th dynasty kings are included in the first intermediate period, and those kings were ruling out of Thebes in Upper Egypt. Although the Heracleopolitan kings and the Theban kings are part of different dynasties, they were actually ruling Egypt at the same time, just in different areas. Eventually, these two groups would come into conflict before unifying under the Theban kings. For the entirety of the First Intermediate Period, there is very little monumental evidence that has been found. Because of this, I'm just going to quickly cover some of the events and the pharaohs of this period. Then we're going to look at two of the main artistic styles from this period, which usually occurred in the middle and lower classes. The only historical account we have for the 7th dynasty comes from the late Egyptian priest Manetho. First, let's go over some of the different sources that Egyptologists used to create a chronology of ancient Egypt. Manetho's writings are the most referenced, but these are very fragmentary, and the pharaoh's names are written in Greek and not Egyptian. There is actually no surviving copy of Manetho's Egyptica, but three later writers quoted his work, which is why only certain sections have survived. Supposedly, Manetho used contemporary records to complete his volumes. One of them is called the Turin Canon Papyrus. This is a king list dating to the New Kingdom, which lists the pharaohs in chronological order with the lengths of their reign. This is still very fragmentary, but the list occasionally sorts different pharaohs based on which capital they were ruling from. The Abydos king list is similar, although it is carved in stone, so it is much more preserved. This is located at the temple of Seti I in Abydos. Because it was located in a temple, it was not actually created for historical reasons, but rather cultic or religious reasons. Because of this, some of the kings that may have not been seen worthy were not included on this list. There are some other king lists from the New Kingdom that help piece together a semi-complete chronology of Egyptian history. Although Manetho included the 7th dynasty in his volumes, that doesn't necessarily mean that it actually existed. Some Egyptologists have considered that this dynasty is completely fictitious, while others think that the kings of this dynasty were real but are actually attributed to the 8th dynasty. The surviving records state that there were either 70 kings in 70 days or 5 kings in 75 days. This rapid succession of kings has been interpreted as a metaphor for the chaos that occurred at the end of the Old Kingdom. Egyptologist Haraj Papazayan believes that some of the pharaohs that were usually seen as belonging to the mid-8th dynasty may have actually been attributed to the 7th dynasty. The 8th dynasty is also not that well known. It probably had multiple kings ruling in a quick succession all out of Memphis. The nomarchs who were the provincial governors of the area continued to rise to power, in particular, the nomarchs of the city of Koptos were very close to the pharaoh, and that is where a lot of the archaeological evidence from this period has been found. Five of the 8th dynasty kings bore Pepi II's throne name, nefer ka -re. Because of this, it has been proposed that the 8th dynasty kings are related to those of the 6th dynasty. Here's a list of the pharaohs that have been attributed to the 8th dynasty. Again, Papazayan has attributed some of these 8th dynasty kings to the 7th dynasty, so his list is much shorter. 
The majority of these kings are not found in the Turin Canon Papyrus, but this may be because there is a gap in the papyrus that would have covered this period. I'm only going to talk about one of the pharaohs during this dynasty because he did attempt to build a pyramid complex. This is Kwaker Ibi. He most likely was the 14th ruler of the 8th dynasty and probably only held power over a small portion of Egypt. The only place that his name is even attested is in the pyramid complex in south of Saqqara. It is near Shephet's Kof's tomb and the causeway of Pepi II. It is very similar to the plan, dimensions, and decorations of the satellite pyramid of Pepi II's queens. It has been proposed that maybe this pyramid was built for one of the queens and then repurposed by Kwakir Ibi. There is a small mortuary temple, but no valley temple or causeway have been found. It was built in the same manner as the Old Kingdom pyramids, but the casing stones seem to never have been mounted, implying that the pyramid was never finished. The burial chamber and the corridors contain the last known instance of the pyramid texts, which were all dedicated directly to Kwakir Ibi. There was also a false door and a surdab chamber for the Ka statue of the deceased. The Ninth Dynasty was founded in Heracleopolis Magna, which is a city in Lower Egypt. It was most likely founded by Mary Ibre Kedi I, who was a local nomarch in Heracleopolis. Eventually, he was able to gather enough authority and declare himself pharaoh. In Manetho's volume, he may have been known as Akthios, who was a wicked king who went insane before eventually being killed by a crocodile. This copper container at the Louvre has the full name of the king, which is one of the only pieces of archaeological evidence that prove his existence. Other than Mary of Ray Kedi I, a lot of the pharaohs of the 9th dynasty are not very well known. This dynasty would lead directly into the 10th dynasty, which was also ruled from Heracleopolis. This is a possible list of the kings of the 10th dynasty. Again, very little is known about these kings, as none of them seem to leave any historical records or build large monuments. Often, the only place that their names are ever attested are in the tombs of their nomarchs, who place their cartouche in their tombs out of respect for their king. Mary Hathor was only mentioned in a graffito at the tomb of Jehudi Noth II. Nefkare VIII was labeled as such because he was now the eighth pharaoh who used the throne name Nefkare. This was after Pepi II Nefkare from the 6th dynasty and then the various kings of the 8th dynasty. The identity of Wakare Kedi is controversial because some scholars believe that he founded the 9th dynasty rather than living in the 10th dynasty. If he ruled in the 10th dynasty, he may actually be the author of a literary composition called The Teachings for King Mary Kare. This text is a king addressing his son and advising him on how to be a good king. In this text, he explains how he sacked the city of Thinis, which had been under control of the 11th dynasty Theban kings. As described in the text, the Heracleopolitan kings sacked Thinis, but unfortunately they later lost it again to the Theban kings. The king then writes that he decided to live peacefully with the Theban kings of the south. He also explains how a king should treat his subjects, how to run the army and religious services, and instructs his son to not take down old monuments, but to quarry new stone. Mary Kare was the next pharaoh, but it is still unclear if he was actually related to Wakare Kedi. Mary Kare most likely tried to continue this peaceful existence with the Theban kings. There is evidence that he did build a pyramid complex in Saqqara, but is yet to be found by archaeologists. This pyramid complex was mentioned in nine funerary inscriptions of the tombs of priests who were responsible for taking care of the funerary cults of Mary Kare and maybe even Teddy from the 6th dynasty. These inscriptions date from the 12th dynasty, indicating that these funerary cults were still in existence and that Mary Carre's pyramid may have been close to the Pyramid of Teddy. Mary Carre died around 2040 BCE, and Heracleopolis eventually fell to the Thebans a few months later. The 11th dynasty is much more well known than the rest of the First Intermediate Period. Only the first six rulers of this dynasty are considered part of the First Intermediate Period. The last couple rulers are considered part of the Middle Kingdom, and we'll talk about them next week. This dynasty traces their origins to the nomarch Intef, who was usually described as the Great or the Elder, to differentiate him from the later pharaohs named Intef. He most likely controlled territory from Aswan in the south all the way to Koptos in the north, with Thebes being his capital. This stela describing the hereditary prince Intefi was found in the cemetery in Dra Abu El Naga and may be associated with Intef the Great. Shertawe Intef I was another local nomarch who rose to power. 
He was the first member of the 11th dynasty to claim a Horus name, which implies that he was the earthly vision of the god Horus and thus a king. This would help declare himself ruler over all of Egypt, even though this rule was contested by multiple different nomarchs, including the Heracleopolitan kings. He was buried in a Saf tomb in the hillside of El Tarif on the other side of the Nile from Thebes. Saf is an Arabic word for row and refers to the row of columns and entries in these types of tombs. It had a sunken courtyard with a colonnade that led to a mortuary chapel. Wa'ank Intef II reigned from Thebes for almost 50 years. When another nomarch named Anktifi died, Intef II was able to unite all of the southern territories together. He was able to obtain possession of the city of Abydos. He started various building projects in both Karnak in Thebes and in the island of Elephantine in the south. The earliest evidence of the god Amun was also found in Karnak during his reign. Intef II was buried in a Saf tomb in El Tarif. There was a trapezoidal courtyard with a mortuary temple on the eastern end. There was also a biographical stella at the entrance of his tomb, which detailed the events in his reign. Another stella was found in this tomb, depicting Intef II and his dogs. Intef III was the next king of this period, and he was most likely the son of Wa'ank Intef II. He was able to extend his father's rule to the gnome just south of Heracleopolis. He only ruled for about eight years, which indicates he might have been older when his father died. Although there are little surviving inscriptions, he most likely built another Saf tomb named Saf el Bakar. This one is very similar to that of his father's, as it has a large courtyard and several rock cut chambers. Currently, though, it is underneath the constructions of a local village. The final king of the first intermediate period was Mentuhotep II, who was the son of Intef III. We aren't going to spend as much time on him today, as he was also the first king of the Middle Kingdom after he united Egypt. The early part of his rule seemed quite peaceful, but in the 14th year of Mentuhotep II's reign, there was an uprising in the north. This may have had to do with the Heracleopolitan kings invading the city of Thinis. Mentuhotep II sent his troops to the north, where they most likely battled with Mary Carre and his troops. It is unclear when the country was fully unified, but it seems to be around the 39th year of Mentuhotep II's reign. We'll talk more about his reign next week and some of the amazing monuments that he was able to build. Now that we understand the complicated history of the First Intermediate Period, let's talk about some of the different art styles that were developing. Each area tended to develop their own artistic styles. The Memphite kings of the 7th and 8th dynasties held fast to the artistic traditions of the Old Kingdom. Because so little survived from the 9th and 10th dynasties in Heracleopolis, we aren't really sure what kind of style developed there. The biggest change occurred in the 11th dynasty in Thebes. Two different styles emerged, and Egyptologists have coined these the pre-unification style and the post-unification style. These both pertain to flat reliefs rather than three-dimensional sculpture. These are some of the main features of the pre-unification style. These reliefs are often much more detailed, and the carving is sometimes layered. The surface within the outline is either modeled or curved, and in certain aspects there are much more intricately carved details. The figures in these reliefs are proportioned by loose guidelines, rather than the grid system we talked about in the first week. These figures are often lacking musculature and have more narrow shoulders. Both men and women are depicted with angular breasts, and men's torsos always show fat rolls. When their hands are portrayed outstretched, they are very straight and there is often no bend in the fingers. And when sitting, only one leg is ever shown. The figures also have large eyes with bands around them and sometimes a double eyelash. Their eyebrows are flat and their broad noses leave lines around the sides of their mouth. Their lips are often protruding and their ears can be quite large. As you will see, these scenes are often offering scenes. An offering scene depicts a deceased person in front of an offering table, which is usually piled on with offerings of food and drink. The table is usually seen with these long feather-like shapes, which are actually meant to represent loaves of bread standing on their side. In the pre-unification style, these offerings are almost hovering over the table. They do not touch or even overlap. And the tips of the bread are pointing outwards from the table. As you can see from this Stella, there is an incredible amount of incised detail, especially on the broad collars, the chests under the chairs, and even the feathers on the goose. The middle Stella also has some of the remaining paint on the body and legs of the deceased. 
This implies that the majority of these stella were plastered and then painted. As I stated before, these inscriptions are known as offering or funerary stella. The stella allowed the living to commemorate with their dead relatives. As I discussed previously, the Egyptians believed that you still needed to eat and drink in the afterlife. Your living relatives were the ones responsible for continually feeding their deceased relatives. Families would commission these stella to provide for their deceased relatives, but they would also leave real food out by the stella or in their tombs. Bread and beer are the most common offerings. The food that was left was actually considered the payment to the local priests who would check in and clean these local temples and tombs. In contrast, the post-unification style had almost the opposite effect. These reliefs were very shallow and smooth, with very little incised detail. The proportions were governed by the square grid that we talked about in the first week, which helped control the height and width of the figures. The figures are also portrayed slightly more muscular, with broad shoulders. Their hands are still outstretched, but they always have a slight curve to them. And when seated, both legs can be seen. Their faces are much more modeled, and they have a more youthful appearance. These features are very smoothed and idealized. Finally, the offerings that are shown on the table often interlock, and the tips of the bread are pointed inward. The inscriptions on these offering or funerary stella always contain an offering formula, which is otherwise called a hetep dinisut. This was a set sentence that helped dedicate funerary objects. It allowed the deceased to partake in the offerings presented to the major deities by the king or the offerings that were directly given by their family members. It always starts as an offering given by the king, too, and then lists a series of gods and their epithets, which are like titles. Osiris, the great god, lord of Abydos, and Anubis, who is on his mountaintop, are two of the common deities mentioned. The formula continues with listing different offerings that the king is giving to the gods for the deceased. Bread and beer were the standard, but oxen, birds, alabaster, clothing, and oil are some of the other common offerings. The formula ends with, for the ka, of, and then the deceased person, Mahaheru. Mahaheru is a phrase that is usually listed after the name of the deceased person, which could indicate that they were judged morally justified in the afterlife. This is typically translated as both true of voice or justified. These stella could also contain longer bibliographic texts detailing the events of their life or their family. Next week, we're going to start with the first half of the Middle Kingdom, continuing with Mentuhotep II. Thanks and stay safe.